Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, take your copy of God's Word. Go to Ephesians 6, the sixth chapter of the New Testament book of Ephesians. And while you're making your way to uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 is going to be our primary focus from this text this morning beneath this uh, title, The Wardrobe of a Warrior. That's the name of the series that we'll be in for the next several weeks. And specifically this morning, we're going to talk about dressed for success. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to begin our reading at verse 10, and we're going to make our way through for uh, the tenor and the tone of the text to contextually get a hold of what Paul's saying. We're going to read through verse 12. Now, it is our custom, if you can, to rise out of reverence for the reading of God's Word. If you can't, no condemnation. Uh, you uh, take your leisure as the Lord leads. Look at chapter 6, verse 10, where Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, Father, for what we've already partook of in worship, we simply pray to stay in your audience, to just stay focused for these moments, that your word may find lodging in our hearts. What we want is not to hear from a man. What we want is revelation from your word. So we pray in the name of Jesus, let no spirit that's not of the Holy Spirit have any authority in this room. Remove any distraction, division, anything that in any way would detour the movement of your spirit and the ministry of your word. And all God's people said, please take your seat ever so quickly. Now, <clears throat> this morning, uh, I, uh, I've got a very simple outline to just hang our thoughts on for just a moment. Um, the old adage, I'm told that it actually started with Hamlet, uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, when uh, Paulinus said to uh, Leveriot, uh, it is the garment that makes the man. Now, we took that and we turned it into uh, a little bit of a debate. Do the clothes make the man or do the man make the clothes? Uh, what we're looking at this morning in the wardrobe of the warrior is a very specific culmination of the writing of the book of Ephesians. Paul is uh, pinning what has been called the New Testament equivalent of the book of Joshua. Now, if you remember the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, uh, we tend to sometimes we've allowed our hymnology or perhaps uh, the lack of a good theology to teach us that somehow or another that the promised land is a picture of heaven. But that, that's simply not true. It's, that, that doesn't hold theological water. Number one, when you get to the promised land, there's battles. And uh, though the promised land was given, you had everywhere you put the sole of your foot. So there was the promise, I, I'm giving it, but you got to go get it. It's a picture of the spirit-filled life, meaning simply this, that in the Christian life, there are going to be uh, hurdles. There's going to be heartbreaks. There's going to be some seasons when you're going to have to fight to get what, you, what you've been given in order to appropriate your faith. That's what Ephesians is. Uh, chapter 1 of Ephesians is this incredible uh, step into uh, eternity where that we find out that in times past, God responded to our rebellion. If you were to, if you were to illustrate the book of Ephesians, this is at least how I, I, I see it in my sanctified imagination. It, it's almost like this massive funnel where that you start in Ephesians 1 with this universal pro proclamation that while we were yet sinners, though that's a Roman statement, it's, a, it's an Ephesians truth that God didn't react to our rebellion. He already had a plan. He knew that we were going to rebel against him. So in Ephesians 1, we are told that in the mind and the plan of God, they stood up before they spun the world on its axis and said, we're going to create them that they may have fellowship with us, but here's the truth of the matter. They're going to sin against us. 
And even though they're going to sin against us, this is what we're going to do. Before the foundations of the earth were spun on its axis, we're going to appropriate an answer. And the Son of God is going to put on the flesh of humanity, come through the womb of a virgin, be nailed to an old rugged cross. He's not just going to pay for the sins that you did to that point. He's not going to just pay for the sins that you were doing when you got saved. He's going to pay for every sin you've ever done. Because when God looks at our sin, he doesn't see it in segments. He sees it as an act of rebellion. And he says, paid in full All of it. Chapter 1 is this deep, immersing, theological, overwhelming truth that God so loved us that he sent his son to come get us knowing we were going to rebel. Ephesians chapter 2 is this theological moment we are seated in the heavenlies. We have been told by religion that we are going to float on a cloud and pluck a harp and flop around like angels. I got news for you. You are not an angel. I'm telling you, you you were made for redemption. No angel has ever known what it is to receive the mercy and the grace of God. No angel knows what it is to be rescued from their their depravity and placed in the Lamb's book of life. You are not going to float on a cloud. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 says, as a product, as as a result of God sending the Son in Ephesians 1, he said we are seated in the heavenlies and this is what we're going to do in eternity. We are, along with all the, other, all the other phenomenal celestial things we're going to do, he said that we are going to peer off, we're going to search into the deep riches of the eternal mysteries of God. This is, this is, this is how I translate it in my, in my remedial mind. Every time we, we peer off into the grace of God that saved us and we think, boy, it can't get any better than that. I mean, that's absolutely the most phenomenal thing I've ever seen. God's going to just reach down and pull back a whole nother level and say, you think that's good, get a hold of this. And for the next one million years, we're, go- we're, going to, we're going to peer into the inexhaustible, absolute riches of Jesus Christ. And when we get to the end of that, he's going to say, you thought that was good? He's just going to reach down, pull back another veil and say, get you a handful of that for the next two million years. Chapter 3, he brings us, uh, he's bringing it down from the universal to the heavenlies. Now in chapter 3, he reveals to us that very controversial but biblical, inescapable truth that we are dispensationally locked into an economy of God. That for some glorious reason, God reached down, got a bunch of Gentiles that were outside the covenant of Abraham, grafted them in, and for this season, he's using us to make the Jews jealous of the riches of God. I hate to tell this, but it needs to be told. Your pastor's wife rebuffed my first offer to go out. (laughs) I know you're amazed. Tall, good-looking guy like me. I mean, who, who could say no? I talked to her mom. Her mom had prayed, and I talked to her dad and said, can I marry her? And she, he said, if you can get her to go out with you, I'm sure. <laughs> I extended an invitation and she said no. So I reverted to the most godly strategy that I could find. I paid a girl $10 to go out with me to a restaurant that I knew her family frequented after our church services. I paid this young lady. I said, I'm going to give you $10. I'm going to buy you everything you want at the restaurant. But here's the point. I really don't want to have lunch, supper with you. I need you to laugh at everything I say. Bat your eyes. Woo over me like I am the second coming of Clint Eastwood. I had a friend that was a busboy at the restaurant, and I said to him, there's a lady, a young lady I'm, I'm trying to, to get to go out with me, and she's out of the will of God. I'm going to come in with another young lady, and I need you to make sure that a table, because this is where the little fields always sit, I need you to make sure I get the table where that out of the corner of Christy's eyes, she can see me sitting there with this other girl laughing and Googling over me and just struck by my awesomeness. (laughs) And I know what you're wondering. Did it work? There she sits right there. Now, that's a pathetic way to illustrate chapter 3, but that's exactly what God's doing right now. He is using us with the grace, the mercy, the gifts, with the high calling to say to the Jews, don't look for the coming of Messiah. Listen, Messiah's been here. 
Then chapter 4, it's as as if it were a a hinge on a door. He moves from the deep theological profound truths and he swings open the door on the practical application of what he just told us. For see that theology that doesn't become practical application is just information that brings frustration. If all you know is what you know, but what you know doesn't change where you go, then what you know is no good. If what I know about him does not move me to a deeper intimacy with him, that's what chapter 4 does. It says, therefore, and it moves me into a place. Now watch that, watch that funnel, if you could get it in your mind. You're moving from eternity past when God said, we're going to get them even though they're rebels. And in chapter 2, when we get them, we're going to see them in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Chapter 3, they're going to be part of a dispensational economy to announce the coming of the king. Chapter 4, it just keeps narrowing down. Now he comes to the home. Now we move from chapter 4 in that he's telling us not to, not to stop walking, but to keep making advance, uh, not only that we press into the darkness, but we dispel it with the light of the gospel. Chapter 5, he moves us into the home, and he teaches us how to walk by faith and live by faith and love by faith. In chapter 6, he gets very intimate, and he calls us out and says, Hey, dads, hey, moms, hey, children. I've often said, if you want to have Holy Ghost snot slinging, pew jumping, soul saving, devil chasing revival, just let the kids go home and clean their room. Okay, let me try it on this side. Just go home and get the cereal bowl you slid up under there last Christmas that now is a fungus among us. Take it to the kitchen. Bring your dirty drawers to the laundry room and say to mom, Mom, I was talking to the Lord and he wants me to run the vacuum. Your mother will pass out in Jesus right there. He just narrows it down. He just narrows it down. And now when he gets to chapter 6 in verse 10, it, it's that word finally. Now, I, I, there's three words in this outline. I can't promise I'm going to get to all of them. Let's write them down by faith. He, he starts with a word of motivation. Motivation. Now, the, the word finally, it's not a conclusion. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not proficient enough in the Greek other than to say to you that what the word literally means is that it means for the future. It doesn't mean the end of something. It quite literally remains, means the remainder or the reason for the rest of. So when you get to chapter 6 and verse 10, he is not saying, okay, finally, I'm going to move you into the wardrobe of the warrior. This is what he's saying. Here's the motivation. He's moving us into a reality that everything he's told us from the big picture of the universe, God came to get us when we were rebels. Chapter 2, he seated us in heavenly places. We are as saved today. I know you're sitting on a pew. You're sitting at a specific location in a specific moment. But I'm telling you, if there was a moment when you called upon the name of Jesus, you trusted what he did at Calvary, you're sealed under the day of redemption, you are already in heaven as if you were in heaven. That's an amazing thought. Chapter 3, how does that affect me? It is that I'm living out the reality that I'm a part of something much bigger than me. Chapter 4, that affects affects how I walk by faith. Chapter 5, it affects how I live and love by faith. Chapter 6, it affects how I relate myself to my wife, my children, and those around me. So he says, this is the motivation. Finally, this is how you appropriate everything I'm about to say to you. So he brings it to this teleos moment, and he says... The Christian life is not the absence of a fight. It's the presence of the champion in the fight. It's not the absence of trial. It's the presence of Jesus in the trial. So he doesn't move us away from the fight. He equips us in the fight. And here's the motivation. He wants us to understand that when we come into very specific seasons, that resistance from the enemy is not because we're doing something wrong. Oftentimes, it's because we're doing something exactly right. I read about uh, some time ago, um, as preachers do, we're all guilty of it. We, 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 we uh, tend to uh, put an unsanctioned building program on the temple. Y'all a little slow this morning, aren't you? <laughs> you? You know not, you are the temple of God, and sometimes we... We expand through the Oreo movement, and we put on a few pounds, and uh, I heard about a pastor. It really got out of control. I mean, he just, he, it, his, his weight was impacting his health. It was impacting his ministry. He had just allowed it to get way out of hand, and he had a friend that spoke truth and love to him, and he said to him, listen, dude, you're, you're going to shorten your life. You're, 
You're undermining your ministry. You're losing your energy. You, you got to do something. And the old preacher said, well, I, I know I've struggled with my whole life. It's probably why I'm not even married. Nobody wants to marry an old, fat, bald preacher. And he said, listen, man, you've you got to think. You've got to be more positive about this. He said, no, nah, I've tried everything you can imagine. I've tried every diet there is, every pill. I've done it all. He said, I just can't lose weight. No woman ever going to have me. This is just my misery in ministry. Well, about two days later, his friend, who loved him desperately, set up a system of motivation. Early that morning, there was a knock on the door. The big old preacher waddled up to the door, had a little Debbie in this hand, one of them Weigel's double chocolate milks in this hand, had him a Snickers in his robe just for a backup. He opened that door, and there stood the prettiest, nicest, Young lady that went to his church, he'd looked at her many a time. They, they'd make a great pair, but she wasn't going to. There she stood, had her jogging suit on. She just kind of in a little jog like this. He said, my, what are you doing here? She said, well, your best friend, old Deacon Bob, said he's got to help you lose some weight. And I've just decided it's the, if you can catch me, preacher, you can marry me. <laughs> Hello, somebody. But he didn't even go change his clothes. He didn't even take off his bathrobe. Son, he slung that little Debbie one way. That milk went the other way. I'm telling you, with a robe flying, buddy, he made it to the end of the driveway before he had sucking air like a vacuum cleaner. (laughs) Next morning, knock on the door. There she was. She just jogging. Said, preacher, if you can catch me, you can marry me. Oh, this went on week after week, day after day. I'm telling you, preacher got past the driveway. He got around the block. Pounds were, were melting. Muscles were building. I'm telling you, he was nigh under grabbing hold of the love of his life. They were making miles by the day. And, and you know what'll happen. You know what'll happen. But, but Thanksgiving rolled around. Oh, yeah. Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Thanksgiving rolled around. All them blue-haired women, I mean, all them senior women started bringing cakes and pies and cookies. And boy, he, he couldn't help it. He couldn't help it. He just started shoveling. Boy, the pounds came back. The weight laid on him hard. Boy, his friend was so mad. The, the young lady was disappointed. Boy, preacher was just back in the same job. By the first of the year, he's bigger than he's ever been. Knock on the door. First day of the year. A 400-pound woman standing there, (laughs) gyrating. He said, what are you doing? She said, Deacon Bob said, if I catch you, I can marry you. (laughs) (laughs) Now, (laughs) boy, it just got hot in here, didn't it? It got hot in here. Sometimes, sometimes there's got to be a motivation. Sometimes we sell Christianity in such a way that if you just walk an aisle, pray a prayer, and it, you, you get out of hell, and then you can live the rest of your life without any motivation that you're bigger than something than just going to heaven. What Paul's saying when he uses the word finally, it's a very specific word. What he wants us to get a hold of is, he says, listen, finally, as a result of everything I've been telling you, there is something beyond, there is something greater than yourself. We're about to move into a dimension and the universe that moved the heart of God to send the Father, the truth that we're seated in the heavenlies, the truth that we're part of something bigger dispensationally than ourselves. We're we're moving, therefore, walking circumspectively, loving our family, living out the faith, now it becomes an intimate moment. And in chapter 6, verse 10, verses 10 through 18, it's a very intimate, personal moment in the wardrobe of the warrior. And what he wants us to understand is God did not bankrupt heaven and send the rose of Sharon that we might simply sit by and spectate, Amen. but that we might by faith participate in the greatest mission ever known in the world to advance the gospel. Now, in order to do that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something very quickly for the sake of time, I want you to notice that this word finally, it, 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 it's not only the, saving the last meaning for the future or the remainder of, to, fo- to focus, fixate on what is yet to be. What he, what he does is, is he moves us in a remembrance of something. Now, what I want you to do, I want you to go to uh, 1 Thessalonians. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 
1 Thessalonians 5. Now, this is a truth that uh, is a rehearsal. It's something the Lord taught us uh, some years ago here. But I want to extract, as the same author, Paul, and I want to show you what I mean when he says, finally. He's dealing with two very profound motivations here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, if you're there, say amen. amen. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Now, I, I'm not going to unpack all that other than to say this. You and I are aware of the fact that he is helping the Thessalonican church understand that they didn't miss the rapture. They've not missed the day of the Lord. So in order to do that, he uses two very defining words that fit perfectly into the motivation of chapter 6, verse 10. Times is the word chronos. It's the tick-tock of the clock. You and I live in a time. We are fixed in a moment. We are on August the 11th, 2024, experiencing the tick-tock of the clock. But not only are we in a time. For example, the Hebrews would tell us that we are not in the year 2024. They would tell us, according to both the Torah and the Mishnah and the understanding of God's creative work, Genesis 1, we are in year 5,874. That's the year we're in. So 5,874 years ago, God stepped out of nowhere and spoke everything into existence. And the beginning, the tick-tock of the clock started. That's chronos. That's what we're in. Then he uses the word seasons. The word seasons is the word kairos. And it's not defined by, by a clock or a calendar. It's defined by a, defi by a sovereign minute when God steps into a set of circumstances and just says, I'm going to do it. Man can't take credit for it. The devil can't stop it. Money can't buy it. Nobody can explain it. You can't pack it in, package it in a book. You can't put it in a promotional flyer. God just sets down, does it in such a way that everybody says, that's God. It's a Kairos moment. That's why Jesus says, lift the sails. Let the oil flow. What's he talking about? There are sovereign seasons that you and I live in. Now stay very close into what I'm about to say. What is the motivation that Paul is trying to convey to us? Everything he is building in this wardrobe of the warrior is to help us understand that we, we were saved for a very specific reason and season. Now, let me give you an example. I'm confident that most everybody in this room, unless you've had the privilege this weekend to just be away from uh, any kind of media, social or otherwise, most of us are aware of what's going on uh, in the world. England is quite literally, quite literally burning to the ground as we speak this morning. They had the audacity. I, I, I know this is going to offend some of you. I, 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 st I still just believe that freedom ought to be free, and I cannot believe that England <laughs> stood up and said to America just 40, 24 hours ago, we will come to America and arrest you if you post something we don't like on social media. <laughs> that did not work out the last time. Y'all knew your history, you'd be right here with me. They are losing their country. We, we are quite literally watching Psalm 83 come to pass. In fact, the very language that's been integrated into our universities and our colleges that's being chanted in the streets as they fly the flag of Hamas when they say from the river to the sea. They not only don't know the river and they don't know the sea, they have no clue that demonically they are chanting something out of Psalm 83 that God said would come to pass. And you and I are living in the chronos, the time of its passing, and the kairos moment when God is beginning to say to the world, lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. We are that generation. If it causes you anxiety, I say to you, meet, meet the Prince of Peace. If it causes you worry, I want you to meet the one who can wash your worries away. Quite literally, Psalm 83 said they will surround them like a ring of fire and they will, until they are pushed from the river to the sea, that they no longer shall be. We are watching the fulfillment of prophecy. But it's not just the time of the prophets. It's not just the time of the fulfillment. You and I are living in a very specific moment. Very specific Kairos moment. Uh, now, if, if I were to say to you, uh, you know, we quite frequently rehearse the seven feasts, Leviticus 23, which I believe is God's calendar. If God had a watch, I believe that the big hand is Israel, the, the, the uh, minute hand is Jerusalem, and the, the second hand is the Temple Mount. 
If God had a calendar, it would be Leviticus 23. There are seven feasts, four in the fall, three in the spring, four in the spring, three in the fall, and he fulfilled them chronologically. He fulfilled them chronos, tick-tock of the clock, not the day before, not the day after. He fulfilled them on the day, every one of them four, in complete chronological order. I believe the next three in the fall, maybe not this fall, but the next three fall, will be fulfilled chronologically. But there is a season that most people don't know about because we've been divorced from our Hebrew understanding of who we are in Christ Jesus. There is what is called the ninth of Av or the season of fasting and praying. Uh, the ninth of Av, it would be our, our August, the month of August. It's, it's a very specific season. It begins on the 17th of Tarmuz. That's the month of July. So in the middle of July till about the first or mid of August, the Jews right now are in a fast. They're in a season of preparation. It, the ninth of all, the reason that they're right now crying out to God is number one, Iran was supposed to have hit them uh, days ago, but that didn't happen. And there is some suspicion that what is about to take place uh, the ninth of Av on their calendar, the month of Av and the ninth day begins at the setting of the sun tomorrow. Now, why is this important? And what does this have to do with the motivation of you and I to live out what Christ has for us? I want you to listen to this. We know definitively from the Bible and from Hebrew history that it was the ninth of Av that the 10 spies returned with an evil report in Numbers 13 and they ended up living in doubt and death for 40 years. It was the ninth of Av on 586 B.C. when the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. It was 656 years later to the day that the Romans surrounded Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and destroyed the second temple, ninth of Av. The Bar Kokhba War, which we are not familiar with predominantly in American history, but 850,000 Jewish men, women, and children were massacred by the Romans on the 9th of Av in 135 A.D. In 136 A.D., on the same day, one year later, the Romans hooked up their oxen, plowed the Temple Mount under, and threw salt on it and made this decree. There'll never be another Jew to worship in Israel, and there'll never be another temple. And I'm going to tell you right now, that will not stand in God's economy. You hide and watch. Same day on the 9th of Av, 136 A.D., all Jews were expelled from England on the 9th of Av, 1290 A.D. Expulsion of all Jews from Spain on the 9th of Av, 1492. Germany declared war on Russia, which most historians agree catapulted us from the First, war, first World War, which was, uh, went into the Second, uh, which was a continuation starting on the 9th of Av. Now, is it any, is it any wonder that there's something inside of us that says something's off. See, beloved, it, it, what I'm trying to say to you is this. You weren't made to live by headlines. You weren't made to live by newspapers and, and, and social media. You were born again of the Spirit of God. And what is in you finally is moving you by holy motivation to understand this is the season and this is the reason God saved us. Don't be perplexed by it. Don't be upset by it. Don't, don't say, well, God has forgotten and forsaken us. I'm telling you, God's on the throne and he knows exactly what's going on. Amen. There's a holy motivation. Now, not only is there a motivation... But there's a mobilization. Look very quickly, if you would. Verse 10, he says it this way. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, what he, the word he uses there when he says, uh, my brethren, is the word el, um, adelphos. We get our word delphia, Philadelphia, brotherly love. It's one, of the, it's one of the four words that's used for some capacity of affection, uh, intimacy, or love toward another brother. Now, so what he says is this. Now, before you get to the end of where you're going, before I share with you to step into the wardrobe of the warrior and, and get suited up for what God's called you to, I, I want you to understand you can't do this alone. So not only is it a word of motivation, it's a word of mobilization. You can't do this. That's why the word's plural. My brethren, you will never be able to do this 
by yourself because you and I were made interdependent upon the fellowship, the koinonia, in Christ Jesus. Now, what, what I mean by that is, is simply to say this. Who you, I've said this before and I think it, I think it just bears repeating. Who you hang around, who, who's intimately speaking into your life, will tell other people where your life's going to end up. I'm just telling you, that's, that's, that's just a, that's a, a law you cannot refute. You show me who you're running with, I'll show you what you're running to in, in, every time. You, you run with people that are critical, it's inevitably going to, you're going to become critical. You run with people that live outside the will and the, want, the ways of God, you're going to end up at some point, you're going to end up in that same. So when he says, listen, here's the reason I'm about to share with you what's going on. Here's the mobilization. My brethren. Why didn't he say, finally, you, singular, plural? Because we can't do it alone. There is a principle in the book of Deuteronomy that says when you get ready to go to battle, it's an, it's an amazing um, addendum to the call to war. He said, when it comes time for you to go out, and to marshal the troops, I will go before you to win the victory. Now, you've got to show up for battle. Do you all know what the term AWOL means? It's a military term that means to be absent without leave. Do you know how many believers are AWOL? They're just not showing up. They, uh, they just saved enough to get out of hell, just saved enough to get into heaven, but they're AWOL when it comes to what God's called them to do. There's a reason he uses the plurality of the term, my brethren. There is in Deuteronomy, he said in Deuteronomy 13, when you sound the trumpet for war, there's, there's two exceptions. If the young men that just got married, they're still on their honeymoon, you release them and let them go home and enjoy being newly married. And secondly, if there's anybody in the, tr in, 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 in the, uh, in the troop line that has a spirit of fear, dismiss them. Why? Because fear's contagious. It, it, it spreads. And all it takes, all it takes is just one person stand up and say, well, I'll tell you right now, bless God, we ain't never going, I don't want that preacher smoking again, but we ain't never going to Tazewell. Well, pfft, on you. I got, a, I got a God bigger than you. Amen. We can't afford it. I know that. That's what makes it God, goober. <laughs> Hello? We're not going down there and say, look what we did. Y'all with me this morning? Do you understand the necessity? If I'm going to get where I'm going, I can't get there alone. It's going to take some believers who, who've got a ramrod, Holy Ghost. I'm talking about a backbone like a saw log. And I'm just going to say something right here because you ain't listening to me this morning. So get up here so I can get up here. If y'all don't quit. If you don't quit apologizing for being a Christian in a pagan world, you do not have to qualify the fact that you are a blood-bought, spirit-filled child of God in a nation that's going to hell in a handbasket. You do not have to say, well, I'm a Christian and I, I know that we shouldn't be killing it. No, I am a child of God and God said don't kill the unborn and I'm not apologizing for it. And if you don't like it, buttercup, suck it up. What in the world? Why do we have to qualify everything? Well, I don't want to offend you. Well, the gospel's an offense. You, you walk up and tell somebody, hey, you do know you're going to hell without Jesus Christ. Well, I'm offended. Well, you'll be offended in hell. I don't know what to tell you. What are you going to do? Be offended in hell number two? What am I going to say to you? Stop apologizing for being a child of God. Now, you don't have to be mean about it. But at the same time, you don't have to qualify it. You don't have to say, well, I'm a Christian and I know we think, no, I am a child of God. And I'd just like to say to you, there is nobody and nothing that can solve every problem we've got like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you understand this morning right now that every problem we face from racism to the economics to the, to the, to the eradication of a people called the Jews, the gospel of Jesus Christ could solve every one of those problems if we simply embrace the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, we'd wake up tomorrow morning basically in heaven on earth. Amen. But Christians, Christ, because Christians don't have, they don't, they, they don't have the, the confidence, they don't have the boldness. Why? Because they don't understand the motivation. We are headed to a place where the king is going to have the last word. Yeah. And here's the mobilization. I get spooked when I look around and others are equivocating, moving away from, well, Brother Jeff, I tell you now, there'd be a lot more people come if you'd back off some of that. 
Come to what? Come, come to what? What were they going to? Because Jeff can't set them free. Jesus can. So see, we can't do this alone. I heard about an elderly lady. Uh, I was told this to be true years ago when I first got born again. I'll say it like Aunt Dot said, if it's a lie, it's somebody else's. Uh, she was an ardent believer in a community up north that was, that was just wicked. And she was a standout believer, an African-American lady that th the whole community had just abdicated the faith. And she had an old landlord that was meaner than a rabid junkyard dog. And he hated her because she was a believer. And... She lived just from, from, from paycheck to paycheck. Lived in a little shanty house in the, in the deep in the darkness of that city. And he really didn't want her in the house. But uh, every time that it came time to pay the rent, he just knew he was going to be able to throw out one. Miraculously, she'd get the money. And it just aggravated him to no end over the years because he wanted to get her out of there. He didn't like her faith. She was known. It was back in the day before air conditioners caused us to shut the doors and the windows. And she would sing the songs of Zion in her house. And people would make fun of her. And they'd walk up and down the street. She'd be in there rejoicing, just celebrating Jesus and praising the Lord and having a good time. And finally, one of the neighbors said to the landlord, I think you got her. I heard her say the other day, She's going to have to make a choice between this month's rent and buying groceries. That old landlord, according to the story, he began to relish the thought. Well, I mean, I've got it. She, she's out. Because nobody is going to pay their rent and starve to death. She'll never make it. So every day he came by to see how she was doing. No groceries, no, no food in the cupboard, nothing on the, on the kitchen table. Rent came due and she handed over the money. And he laughed with glee and said, you may get a place over your head, but you got no food in your belly because there is no God. And all that nonsense of you praying to somebody that doesn't exist and worshiping somebody, I'm telling you, the whole neighborhood knows you're done. And it won't be long. If I don't get you out by not paying the rent, you're going to starve to death. Well, she just began to praise God right there on the front porch. She just had her one of them Holy Ghost Hank waving snot slinging Vestal Goodman moments right there in front of his doubt. She said, my father in heaven said, the righteous has never been forsaken, nor his seed seen begging bread. Yeah. Boy, it made him so mad, he jerked his money, put it in his pocket, took off down cussing and a fussing. And it dawned on him, I know how to get her. The next morning, she walked out on that porch to bless the Lord for the new days was her custom. And right there on that porch stoop, was the biggest, prettiest basket of groceries you've ever seen. Fresh bread. Big, beautiful vegetables and big old pack of Oreos. I made that up. <laughs> Fresh milk and flour. Boy, she could hardly pick that basket up. It was so heavy. Boy, she just picked that basket up and she said, Praise the Lord! Bless the Lord! Oh, my soul who has provided! And about that time, that old mean, nasty landlord jumped out from behind the shrubs and said, See there, you old fool? That didn't come from the Lord. I put those groceries there. <laughs> now, what's she going to say? She said, Thank you, Lord. You sent groceries and you used the devil to do it. Praise <laughs> God! <laughs> Everybody needs somebody in their life like that old woman. Everybody needs somebody because once the mobilization comes and you understand you were not saved to sit down soaked and sour, you were saved in a, in a way to be equipped. And I'm telling you by God's authoritative word, you were given something. You were endowed with an ability to do something you couldn't do in the natural so that the world would look at you and see the supernatural. And, and that's the motivation. Here's the mobilization. When I get in the thick and in the, in, in the fire and I look over and I see others pressing on, they're fighting for their lives with cancer. They're fighting for their marriage by faith. They're believing God for prodigals. They're giving money they don't have. They gave up vacations in order for you to have a seat to sit in. I'm telling you, there's times when I'm just about ready to give up and God will let me look across this room and say, boy, don't you give up. Look at them. They got it a whole lot worse. And I'm telling you, on the other side is victory. Amen. My brethren. Y'all, let me tell y'all something. I'm almost, we're two words in. We're three words into the word of God. And we've not scratched the surface. Well, just sit there. Praise God. <laughs> now, watch this. I'm done. I'm done. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. The, the motivation is finally 
there's something coming. The, 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 the mobilization is that I'm on a journey with other believers. Now, here's the appropriation. Now, watch this. Watch this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, <laughs> this, and some of y'all are going to be offended by this, but I, I, this is a compliment. So before you get mad, hear me out. This is a command in the Greek language. It's not a suggestion. It is not saying, hey, I would recommend to you be strong in the Lord. That's not, that's not what it is. This is what he's saying with authority. And Americans don't like authority. They don't, you're not the boss of me. Let me just say this. You, did you say something? That's right. <laughs> Do we need to talk? Don't we? It's just us here and the world. Do we need something you need to say? You want to confess? Right? There's altar, right? Anyway, here we go. We do a marriage retreat every year. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be there. Now, <laughs> this is how Americans act. They say, well, you're not the boss of me. And, and I, I, here's the problem with that. The problem is I'm not the boss of you, but you are bought with a price and you're no longer your own. Yeah. So until you learn how to, in the Kairos moment, the season that you live in, and in the Kronos see, the time that God's given us, we are living in the most exciting terrifying, terrific, wonderful, agonizing, horrifying, glorious time that the church has seen since her birth. That's what we're living in. And, and because of that, because of that, Paul's, Paul tells us, hey, I'm going to make an appropriation through the Spirit. There's the wardrobe of the warrior. Now, if you don't get up and go into that wardrobe and prepare yourself for battle, you're going to be, you're going to be destroyed. So here's the motivation. There's more than just getting saved. Now, I know that, I know that well, even saying that out loud, I've got to check my own spirit. How could there be more than getting saved? Because salvation is just the first step to getting to know the one that saved you. And I'm telling you, it's like marriage. It's like marriage. As, as awesome it was when they opened those doors in that church in Kentucky, and I look back there in all of her glory, and her, her dad and her grandfather are about to walk her down to the aisle to me, I'm telling you, as glorious as it was 33 years ago, it's better today Amen. than it was that day. Yep. And I can't explain that. I can't explain how, how can it be. I don't, because something happened in our spirits. It's the same with the Father. That's why he uses marriage as an analogy. It's the same in your salvation. Salvation is just the entry to getting to know the, the Son. Then the mobilization is when I see him doing stuff through you, I take hope because I'll be honest with you. If I see him use some people and I think, boy, if he can use him. <laughs> oh, come on, y'all. Really? Y'all that holy this morning? Have y'all never met a goober that you looked at and thought, boy, if God could use him, I know he could quit looking or quit pointing. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Y'all have never met anybody you thought, mm, his cornbread's not done. The lights are on, but nobody's home. Y'all ain't met nobody. Quit pointing over. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And then you see God use them in a way that you think, ho, 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 that's unbelievable. And you go, I bet God could do that with me. Because I'm just a degree smarter than that moron. So, I mean, I know he can do it with me, right? There's motivation. There's mobilization. I watch the appropriation. He says, be strong in the Lord. That word right there is, it can be an offensive word if you don't know what it means. In Romans chapter 4, I, I don't, I don't want to miss this. I want you to write this down in your own private praise and prayer time. Go back and look at it. Don't take my word for it. In Romans chapter 4, verse 20, it's speaking of Abraham. And I want you to listen. He uses the same word, and then I'm going to tell you what it is, and I'm done. Romans chapter 4, verse 20. He staggered not at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, Giving God glory for his promises. That's Abraham. So what Paul is saying is, God showed up one day and he said to Abram, hey, you're going to be a dad. And Abram said, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but <laughs> my wife is older than dirt. <laughs> and uh, we're not going to have any pampers because we're both in the pens. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> this is not happening. Watch what the Bible says. He staggered not... But in strong faith. 
That word strong, both in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, and in, in, and in Romans 4, 10, 4, 20, it literally means to be hard-headed. I wrote my sermon notes, Fairview Knox Church. <laughs> it means to be hard-headed, headstrong, determination that will not relent in the face of facts that will not move. <laughs> Just sit there. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? Watch this. I promise you, somebody in this room right now, this is, what this is what's happening. They're sitting right there, and they cannot wait for this to be over. They're looking at their clock. My, is this guy ever going to shut up? I just need to get out of here because I felt something in the middle of that worship service, and my heart's pounding, my hands are sweating. And I, I, Maybe he's right. Maybe, maybe we're in this Kairos moment, this, 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 this ninth of all. Maybe something is about to happen, and I, I just need to get up and go out of here. Listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Th this is what the enemy's saying. You've been too bad. You've done too much. You, you listen, don't you, don't, you, don't you get saved this morning. Both that church knew half of what you did. And we're not talking about yesterday. We're talking about last night. If that church knew half of what you've been into, they wouldn't let you on the parking lot. See, see here, here, here's, here's what Paul's trying to say. You're not saved based on what you've done, what you're doing, or what you did. You're saved based on what he accomplished at the cross of Calvary. I can't go into the wardrobe with a warrior and appropriate anything because I don't have the capacity, the intellectual ability, but because of what he did at Calvary, I've got the, I've got the authority to walk in and say, Father, put the, put the helmet of salvation on this old wicked head. I want you to put the breastplate of righteousness over my heart that's wicked and deceitful and I cannot know it. And Lord, would you shod my feet with the preparation of the gospel because I'm hanging out with some soul winners and I've got to be in a birthing chamber called a living room and I watched two men step from death to life the other day and I saw them in the jail in the jail brother Joe's baptizing over 50 jail people people prisoners in the jail can I tell you they're some of the freest people in all of Knox County you cannot get saved based on anything you've ever done and you cannot not be saved based on anything you've ever done you are saved because of what he did and when he said, finally be strong in the Lord. Strong-willed. I, I, put, I, put, I put down mule-headed. Don't make me call names. Mule-headed. See, what happens is once I, I come to the reality that this world is not, it's not going to hell it's coming to Jesus. And what's happening, I just, I'm going to say this in closing. I have a sneaking suspicion. Now, this is not a prophetic word. I don't want anybody to misunderstand. I, the Lord didn't wake me up three this morning and say, this is what's coming. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I, don't, I didn't say that. But I do have, from my biblical understanding, I think that the water has broken, to borrow biblical language, I think the water broke in May of 1948. Israel came back to the land. And I think the tick-tock, the chronos of God's prophetic timeline started ticking in such a way that now we're in a kairos moment. Russia is moving armaments to Iran. Iran has declared they're going to unleash a destruction on Israel unlike anything ever seen. Why didn't they do it 72 hours ago? Why not 48 hours ago? Why didn't they hit them on Sabbat at the setting of the sun Friday? I think they're waiting on the ninth of Av because it's a demonic pattern. And if you watch the enemy, this is what he'll do. He moves in prescribed demonic ways. You can, you can, you can pick up on that slew foot sucker. You can watch him. You, you, he's, he's not as smart as some of us think he is. And by the Spirit of God, you can unveil him. Now listen to me. I... I, I I know some people are going to say, well, God just, God's just forgotten us. He's just, the world's just in a mess. And here comes the tribulation because God hates us. No, that's not true. The tribulation is not God hating the world. The tribulation is God saying to the world, you didn't want me. This is what the world looks like without me. One will rise to preeminence. He'll have every answer. Paul said, when they say peace and safety, peace and safety, you better pay attention. Beloved, there's one coming on the scene soon. And he's going to have every answer to every problem. 
I personally believe he's going to ride in on a white horse, Revelation chapter 6, and he's going to say to the whole world, I will settle what no man's ever been able to settle. I will not only answer the issue in Israel, I'm going to let her rebuild her temple. By the way, the rumors from Israel at 3 o'clock this morning were they were on the temple mound practicing to cut the throat of the red heifer on the 9th of Av. <laughs> but wouldn't that be a slap in the devil's face? I'm going to ask you something. What more does God have to do? What more does he have to say to you? He sent his son. He's made it plain. The world is a cauldron. The fuse has been lit. You sense it. All of creation is groaning for the coming. Please, Jesus, come. And yet some of you week after week after week sit here knowing that if he comes before the sun sets today, you have no hope. Some of you are believers, but you've never been to the wardrobe of the warrior. And when we're in battle and we look over your AWOL, we can't find you. Dressed for success. So I want to ask you in closing, do the clothes make the man or does the man make the clothes? Now, we're a Baptist church. We do not vote, but I'm going to make an exception. Today, we're going to vote, probably split this church wide open. (laughs) If you believe the clothes make the man, will you please raise your right hand? Clothes make the man? Nobody believes clothes makes a man. Nobody. Oh, got one. Thank you, Brother Bill. One honest man back there. If you believe that the man makes the clothes, will you raise your left hand? If you are still alive, will you raise both hands? (laughs) up with y'all today you think UT played and lost last night what is up with y'all let me tell you what is going to happen soon and very soon we're going to drop this bag of bones and I'm going to heaven and I'm getting a new wardrobe it's called a marriage garment Revelation 19 says on white stallions dressed for the marriage supper of a lamb I'm going to be six foot three. I'm going to have an all white, four piece tuxedo. That's what I got. It's my, it's my sermon. I'll preach the way I want. I'm going to have Joel Osteen hair. I'm, I told my wife the other day some of these boys around here getting these perms. I'm thinking about getting me one. I'm going to let it grow out and just get me a big old perm just so by faith. Just by faith. Somebody said, what'd you do, preacher? I'm just practicing for when I get to heaven. (laughs) We're this close to going home. You better get to the wardrobe of the warrior while you got time. So when you get your marriage garment, you won't be ashamed at the appearing of the king.